Hello, some of you may have seen this video on the BBC this week and it raises a number of issues that I thought I would offer some thoughts on. But to be clear, I'm making this video in response to, but not as a response to this video. This distinction is kind of important because I don't know the circumstances of the young girl in the video, uh, Laura, I think. I don't know her personal circumstances, so I can't and wouldn't address them specifically. And this video certainly isn't any kind of criticism of her. Instead, I'm going to look at the finances involved and how university can be navigated by those who can't, for any reason, approach their parents for financial help. Before we get into the video as well, it's important to say that there is financial help available. There's hardship loans, emergency loans, there's bursaries, there's various grants uh, that depend on your circumstances. So please, if you're struggling financially, see the student union, see your student rep, your personal tutor, before you do anything really. Do not drop out without seeing these people and understanding what help's available to you because they generally will work their butt off to get you through your problems. Just to let you know as well that I may be old but I have just or I will graduate this year and while my mum and dad are here and would have helped me if I needed it, I did never ask them for anything from while I was at university. I put a roof over my head, this one, um, and paid my way and managed on my loans and with a bit of part-time work. And I did find that interesting that in this video there's a lot of talk about not being able to afford nights out. But there's no mention of the fact that a large number of the bar staff, the waiters, etc., people that serve you food and drink and, and look after you basically on your nights out, are your fellow students who are paying their own way. So the finances for most students will break down like this. You will get a student loan from Student Finance England, uh, which will cover your course fees. If you earn below a certain threshold or live in a household where the combined earnings are below that threshold, which I think is about £15,000 per annum, it might be 18, um, you will be eligible for a maintenance loan to cover your living expenses. Depending on earnings, that will be some part of or the maximum of about £8,500. Now, a few years back, before the Tories changed the tax codes, it wasn't inconceivable that this would actually be a monthly wage. If you take the £8,500 as a 10-month year, like the academic year, then it comes out to £850 per calendar month, a survivable but not particularly comfortable wage. The assumption at uni is that you will provide for yourself for the other two months of the year. But can you, with no other financial input, survive the entire year on that amount? Yes, but your personal choices will impact heavily on how easy it is. The university year breaks down into two teaching blocks of 12 weeks. The first starts in September and ends at the Christmas break. The second starts in January and ends in May with the Easter holiday interfering at some point. Your maintenance loan is paid to you like this. At the start of each teaching block you'll get about £3,000 with the balance, somewhere in the region of £2,000, paid to you in May. The choices you make regarding your accommodation will have the largest impact on your finances, assuming you don't splurge your first £3,000 on a Mulberry handbag, of course. There are a lot of housing options available. Probably student accommodation provided by your university is the most obvious to try. The university I've just graduated from here in Portsmouth has a lot of options, as you can see here, all of them are bills included. This heating is irrelevant. It's only there to make it sound a bit better because your heating will be gas or electric anyway. Only the most expensive options are catered. If you're determined not to work and have no financial support beyond your maintenance loan, you will need to pick from this end, the cheap end. Paying £6,700 for accommodation out of £8,500 leaves you just £1,800 to cover all of your other bills for the year, including finding accommodation between June and September when the halls are shut. You must consider what you're going to do for those months, and it's probably best to allocate most, if not all, of your final payout in May to covering them. Student accommodation anywhere will have options between £100 and £200 per week, but without supplemental income, you will need to look at the lower end. This is Bates and House. This is probably the small room at £100 because this 3D viewer looks a bit larger so it's probably the £110 option. For me I'd take the larger option because you may spend a bit more time here if you're on a tight budget than if you're not. 
this does look a bit like a prison cell and those blinds do look a bit like the bars the larger one looks much better and you can see they're doing their best to hide these hideous walls but hey that's what blue tack was invented for the large one doesn't look so bad even with this picture of john terry on the wall the stove looks a bit old but everything else looks okay if it was me i'd probably want an ensuite though if it's communal you may find the cleaners are in three or four times a day so it probably won't be too bad it's just that anyone who's used a public toilet before will be reluctant to do so a second time. There's no 3D thing in Trafalgar building, but all of this is modern and looks okay. I expect it's the more expensive one again, which at £5,960 is probably going to eat too much of your loan, so you might want the cheaper one. If you want my advice, I'd rule out anything above 5500 as that will leave you less than £3,000 to cover spending and food money for the entire academic year and the summer break. Paying £5,500 a year if you don't need to hold anything back to the summer leaves you with £300 spending money in your pocket for the 10 months at uni. So if you assume you need £1,800 for your summer, that is £1,200 for the 10 months or £120 a month at uni. Not very much. The uni says you should allow £35 a week for food, and even that is then above your budget. However, it is possible to manage on less if you're frugal and shop right. For example, noodles at your local or uni shop will likely cost you the better part of a pound. However, the local Asian market will probably sell you something like five packs for one pound. That's the sort of economising that you will probably need to consider. And I'm not saying you need to live on 20p noodles, just to be clear, but if you spend wisely, you can eat well for under 35 pounds a month. If you spend four pound at Starbucks on the way to uni, and again on the way home, you are over your budget before the weekend has even arrived. Also, Starbucks don't pay their proper tax in the UK, so shop somewhere locally that does. Another option you can explore, and your university will probably be able to help you, is to lodge privately off campus. You will probably find a family or a professional couple looking for a lodger quite easily. Here it is especially helpful if you're working because the notice boards at workplaces are usually full of adverts for this sort of thing. The benefits, of course, is that they may not expect you to leave during the summer, but it's important to be clear on that before you move in. Also, be clear that as a full-time student, you do not pay council tax or affect a landlord's, so don't let them charge you for it. Also, be clear up front what bills are included. For ease of budgeting, you want as much in as you possibly can. You will probably have to provide your own food here, as with the student accommodation. Lodging will range from 200 to as high as five or 600 pounds a month. 100 to 150 pounds a week, as with the student accommodation, is probably more normal. Much depends on what they're offering, location and the size of the rooms and things. Before committing, consider also how far from the campus you are prepared to live and how you're going to get there. There may well be a free or subsidised student bus, but if you're not in student accommodation, it's more likely you will not be on the route. You may need to budget for your commute. Or if you're buying a bike, you need to include that in your calculations as well. It can cost you as little as £10 for a second-hand bike, but there is practically no limit to how expensive they can get. Also, you might want to put aside some money for potential repairs if your budget is tight and you are reliant on the bike to get you to uni. If you're prepared to share with somebody like that, then you may prefer to club together with some friends and rent a house or flat between you. Be aware that if these are privately rented, they may not even allow students. If they are student-specific accommodation, then again, you may need to find somewhere else in the summer be sure before you move in. Personally, I don't think that I would recommend this method. It might well be more cost effective, but nothing ruins friendships and relationships quicker than money issues. And if there are four or five of you living together, then chances are somebody isn't going to pay their way. However, if you still want to, then at least take this piece of advice, get everything in writing, get a joint account to pay your bills that everyone has access to, and make sure that everyone pays into it by standing order on the same day and get your bills to go out on that day as well. You will need to talk to your bank and all the utilities to make this happen. Check the account regularly to make sure everything is happening as it should be. Anyone that won't agree to these terms is probably not somebody you want to live with. 
no matter what your heart says. You can expect your bills to break down like this. Rent is likely to be about two to £250 per person, i.e. a four-bedroom house will likely rent from £800 to £1,000 per calendar month. Electricity and gas, you should expect three to four hundred pounds a quarter to cover electricity and gas for two people. Three or four people, though, won't pay eight hundred. It's more likely to be four or five hundred. It varies from house to house, by season and by person, so it's really difficult to get a proper guess on what your gas bills will be like. In Portsmouth, you will pay Portsmouth Water to deliver your water, and you will pay Southern Water to take away the sewage. So you can expect these to cost you somewhere between 15 to 25 pounds a month. You will not pay council tax if you are all full-time students. If one person living in the house isn't, then you will need to come to some sort of arrangement and get it in writing as before. This is calculated by the value of the house and the absolute minimum in Portsmouth is about 100 pounds a month. If you're in a four or five bedroom house and you find that there's council tax to be paid, it's likely to be much more than that. You will need home contents insurance. You probably shouldn't have to have buildings and contents insurance because your landlord should cover the building and you will cover your contents. This is likely to be 100 to 200 pounds a year. It's more if you want to cover expensive items like phones, mulberry handbags and laptops while they're out of the house. A TV license is 15 pounds a month and you will also have to pay for the internet. The only one of these you can really push down is the rent and that by looking around and obviously finding the cheapest option available to you. You should also consider that while you're at uni that you will have to pay money for books. How many will depend on your dissertation as the library and online journals and ebooks will cover most of the text you need for your unit. But if your dissertation is something specialist you will have to find those books. Like a fool I did mine on Robert Heinlein, a American author from the 1950s and the 60s and I was spending a fortune on books because all of the books I wanted I had to buy and I had to have shipped over from America. So if all of this is starting to look too expensive then the next option available to you is to swallow some pride and get yourself a job. Not everyone can work so please if that is you do see the tutors and the unions at uni and they will advise you or at least connect you with somebody who can help. There is definitely help out there for you. Obviously as well your course will take priority over any job you do get and you will want to work around your timetabled hours in a way that does not impact your grades. There are a handful of part-time paid positions for students offered by the university, so keep an eye out for those and apply for them if you think they will suit you. Your timetable will never include weekends, so a weekend job is completely viable and there are plenty of them out there. Supermarkets, bars and similar places are always looking for weekend staff. You can also join an agency to help you find a position. These do not affect your loans unless you are extremely well paid, which is unfortunately not very likely. Remember, if you agree a plan with an employer where you are working between Monday and Friday, that your timetable will likely change from teaching block to teaching block. So you might need to change that plan in the future. For example, in my first semester, I was never at uni after 4 p.m. So I managed to work four till midnight quite a lot in that period. After that, I was at uni later into the afternoon on occasional days, but I also had the odd day here and there where I wasn't at uni at all, so I could work on those. A few non-uni folk might suggest that you can work the holidays, but be careful particularly at Christmas. Although there's a lot of casual work available, especially at the post office, for example, your teaching block one will be ending and you will likely have a lot of assignments due in January. And you may also want to start reading up for teaching block two. This will be a pretty busy time for you, but with no lectures, you could probably work some time, especially if you prepared for your assignments as well as you could in advance. You can expect in year one and two to have three, four, or even five assignments to do in the Christmas break, depending on your option. Portsmouth Uni is doing what it can to stop these all coming at students at the same time, but it's still likely you'll have a fair bit on, and in year two, you'll also be preparing for your dissertation. The summer holidays are longer at uni than at school, Classes usually finish in early May and don't start again until late September. While in May, especially in year one and two, you will likely have a deluge of assignments and exams to do. By mid-June, you will be free. Just in time for some seasonal work.
Year three, you only do two options at a time rather than the five you do in year one and two. You will be at uni less, so you'll be more flexible to work the odd shift around it. But don't do so at the expense of your dissertation or assignments because standards in year three are higher, and I promise you that your dissertation will be more work than you think. I found that although I was at uni less in year three, I was working much harder at home on uni stuff and worked less. Working part-time, 16 to 24 hours a week, will absolutely not impact in, on your studies, in my opinion. Although you may want to cut down your hours as much as possible in April and May to finish your last assignments and prepare for your exams. The same may well apply at Christmas, but I found the deadlines there were more forgiving, so it'll depend on your circumstances. If you're in student accommodation or lodging and you're working 16 to 24 hours a week, you will only have financial problems if you're going crazy and wasting your money. You will certainly be able to enjoy nights out with your friends. If you're not working, then the problems you have as a student are identical to those faced by millions of people in this country every day. You'll have to get yourself organized, you'll have to draw up a budget, and you'll have to live within your means. The uni will help you all they can, but managing on a maintenance grant alone is going to require a little bit of work on your part, namely saving money where you can. Working weekends will provide you with enough money to turn a financial struggle into something quite comfortable. The balance between work and studying will depend on you and your course, so liaise with your management and cut down a day or be prepared to take a month out at the busiest times if you need to. A zero-hour contract, a thing of evil for most people, is actually your friend if you're at uni. It gives you a flexibility you can take advantage of when your studying load is lower and you can then cut your hours back to zero if necessary when your uni work is starting to build up again. If you're living in student accommodation and exclusively on your loan, then the summer is going to be a hard time. Couch surfing is going to be absolutely awful, I promise you, and it should not be your first, second or even third option in my opinion. You will need to be as frugal and as cheap as you can in term time to make sure you have some money left over for this period, as you may find that getting somewhere to stay is more expensive than where you live in term time. Like Laura says in the video, don't let it get you down, go for it. Do not get stressed and drop out, there's lots of help available to you. Stick with it and have fun. If I did it, you can too. Best of luck with your studies. I just want to talk about other ways of generating a little bit of money, but particularly the bad ways. All of these, apart from one, which I'm going to leave to the end deliberately to make you listen to me prattle on, are, are terrible ways of generating a bit of extra cash for you. So I'm going to start with the least worst, which is to get a bank loan. Now. If you borrow £500 from the bank over one year, you will pay back uh, £50 a month for the whole year, so you'll basically repay £600. You might find it difficult to get a, a bank loan if you're not working at all and you have nothing to secure it against, which is quite likely to be your situation if you are a student and existing purely on your maintenance loan. But if you can get a, a loan, that's how it'll work. It's the least worse of all these options. The next option you can consider is taking something that you own to somewhere like cash converters or another type of pawn shop. How these work is you go in with something that's worth £100, they'll give you 10 and they'll hang on to it for a month. At the end of that month you need to come in and pay a, a fee which is possibly another 10, might be even be 20, depends where you go, and that'll mean that they'll hold on for another month. Or you can go in and give them 30 or whatever it is they say and get it back I've not actually been to one of these myself so I'm only going on anecdotal evidence if after a couple of months you haven't been in and given them the money they will sell your goods and you'll never be able to get them back if you're taking something to cash converters you should probably work on the assumption that you're never ever going to have enough money to get it back so you are effectively selling it and a better option for selling your goods than a pawn shop is obviously somewhere like eBay. Just buy the bullet and go there first, I think, is the better option. You can, if you're in a desperate pinch, get an emergency loan. You've probably seen adverts for them on the television. This is something you desperately want to avoid. The interest rates are ridiculously high because they work on the assumption that everybody that takes one of these loans is one, desperate, and two, a bad credit risk. You do not want to go to these people. You will pay back hundreds for every £10 you borrow don't do it. So the next option and the one that I think that most people are going to take even against my advice is 
a credit card. Now, how a credit card works is you can get them when you're 18. If you aren't working, your credit limit will be probably quite low. It might be a few hundred pounds, something like that. But it doesn't matter anyway, because as soon as you've got that card, you will max that out. Then they'll put it up. You'll max to that limit. They'll put it up. They'll max your max to that limit. And then they'll say, we're not giving you any more until you repay this and you'll be repaying it for the rest of your life. Don't get a credit card. This is how credit cards work. They work on the assumption that the money that you've borrowed is a 10 year loan. So if you borrow hundred pounds and the interest rate on your credit card is 30% and 30% is pretty good. If you haven't got a regular income, you might find that you're paying 45 or even more. Um, so at 30%, you'll be paying 30 pound interest in year one and 10 pound off of the loan. And then in year two, you can see that you're paying nine pound off an amount owed of 90 pounds plus the interest of 27. So the way this works is basically you're never ever going to repay it. Do not get a credit card. You can see here, I've put your age in bold so you can see how long you're going to be paying this. You can see also that I've put how much you, on a hundred pound borrowed, you after 10 years, you'll have repaid more than 250 pounds. Not only that is you'll still be paying it back when you're 30. Do you really want to be paying for things that you've bought as a teenager, things that probably uh, like drinks, maybe a pizza, maybe in like some clothes. Do you still want to be paying for that when you're 30? I don't think that you do. For the love of God, don't get a credit card. You can also see, you know, if I put the interest up to, to 45, you can just see the changes in the repayments. You know, you're now paying over 10 years instead of 250 pounds, you're paying 350 pounds for a hundred pound that you put on a credit card, but you're not going to put a hundred pound on your credit card. Initially, they'll give you a limit and it'll probably be about 500 pounds and you will hit that. And now after two years, you paid 1500 pounds, going on for 1600 pounds, you still owe the money after 13 years. But what will happen is you'll hit the £500 and they'll put your credit limit up to 1000 and then you'll hit that. And now you have paid back £3,500 over 10 years. At this point they probably will go, you're not earning enough to have any more. We're really worried that you're a bad risk, we're not putting it up anymore. But that isn't what they always do. Sometimes they put the limit up more and then you'll hit that and you'll hit that and you just keep going up and up and you'll never repay this. For the love of God, don't get a credit card. Now you might think, oh, I'll just have a store card instead, but a store card is basically a credit card that gives you perhaps some small discount on what you buy, but you're still gonna buy, you're still gonna hit your limit, you're still gonna have repayments to make. So don't have a store card either. So the least worst option, I did promise you one, and here it is. I was in Southampton General the other day for work, and I happened to notice on the notice board in the elevator that they were paying £25 for sperm. So there's always a way, I suppose, to try that instead. Ordinarily on this channel you'll find book reviews, so there's quite a lot of them there if you want to have a look around while you're here. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell, and maybe I'll see you in the next video. Bye.